He was speechless. There's that saying, it took his breath away. He saw them and his jaw dropped. There was a forest of engines. He was amazed. In defiance of the Kremlin's orders, the stockpile of NK-33 engines left over from the moon effort had been preserved in a warehouse safe from prying eyes for almost 20 years. It was not sensible to consign engines that were designed to last and to work to the scrapyards to be melted down. On his own initiative, Kuznetsov collected together all the engines that had been made and preserved them. When you build a rocket engine, you, it's just unbelievable the amount of hours that go into each one of the engines and it's a dedication. It almost becomes like your child. There has to be a value somewhere. They had no idea where, so they just, they just kept them. Now worth millions of dollars, with the visit of Aerojet engineers, it looked like Kuznetsov's foresight in preserving the engines might pay off. But with the NK-33 never having proven itself in flight, Aerojet had some tough questions to ask about the performance specifications being claimed for the engine's closed cycle. Well, engineers never just say, this is fantastic. We're, we're a very, uh, uh, a bit of skeptical type of people. We have to prove things to ourselves technically. We wanted to know for ourselves that that we could back up the claims. That skepticism was deepened by the fact that the closed cycle technology behind the NK-33 was only poorly understood in the United States. They were doing things uh, at a level, they were operating at levels that uh, some in the United States were saying as recently as 15 years ago, you can't do that. And yet they had been doing it for over 10 years. So they had really protected their technology and those of us in the industry did not know how they were doing it. The only way those doubts about the engine's reliability and performance could be resolved would be in a full test firing, the first in 20 years. An engine was sent from Samara to the test stand at Aerojet's facility in Sacramento, California for a proving test set for October 1995. Bring up the sequence computer and load sequence. JSQ, NK firing program. Marker supply pressure. Verify close, locks, engine safety valve. Open engine GN2 start purge supply valve. Open engine start purge tank isolation valve. Verify close, locks, run line drain valve. Well, it is hard to overstate the anxiety that we felt before the test. My hair had already gone white, and I thought, can it get any whiter with all that worry? There was worry, stress, every kind of stress, nervous, physical, moral, psychological. Notify when pressure reaches 3,000. Pressure's up, pressure's 3,000. Stand by for test. NKP2, Q011, 1A001, on the countdown. Siren on. Off at the second bell. Press the camera, Iris. Countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Fire. PC's up. And you're wondering, oh, this is very, very powerful. Is it going to hold together? Is our test stand going to work? Stand by for throttle up. 100% thrust. PC is looking good. The test conductor is calling out certain critical things, and in your mind you're saying, yes, that's right, that's right. It's good, it's good. 
the engine hit each of its specifications. Russia's alternative engineering approach had delivered a technology that, though 20 years old, America had still not managed to equal. We tested it at 10 a.m. That was about midnight here. Everybody was waiting for us to call and let them know how the test had gone. And we said, it's okay. It worked. Aerojet now had all the proof they needed to go out and sell the engines for use on the latest generation of satellite launchers. The man to have bought them knows a thing or two about the rival merits of Russian and American space technology. George Muller, the engineer once at the helm of America's race to the moon. I first came across the NK-33 when we began the development of the K-1, our reusable launch vehicle. We were looking for high-performance engines, and we knew about the Russian engines in general, but it wasn't until then that we really began to understand how efficient they really were. The efficiency of these engines is uh, very good, better than anything else available in the world today. Start flight pressurization. Roger, going to flight pressures. The NK-33's closed cycle technology has now been taken to a further stage in a new Russian engine. That engine is about to make history by being the first to fly on an American rocket. A rocket that started life as an intercontinental ballistic missile pointed at Russia. Five, two minutes, 15 seconds. It's the same every time. It doesn't get any better or easier. <laughs> this one is a little more tense because it's a maiden voyage, but uh, yeah, it doesn't get any easier. Rocket scientist John Karras of American space giant Lockheed Martin is on his way out to the launch pad at Cape Canaveral, just a few days ahead of the inaugural flight of the latest Atlas rocket, powered by a Russian RD-180 engine. Twice the size of the NK-33, the new RD-180 takes Russian closed cycle technology to new limits of performance, offering thrust levels almost five times those of a jumbo jet. If the launch goes as planned, the RD-180 will enter the history books as the first Russian booster engine to power an American rocket and its communication satellite payload into orbit. We're working a couple small items this morning, really one item. So we're doing uh, final checks and uh, we're closing things out. In about an hour from now, we'll be actually buttoned up for launch and we really won't do anything uh, the rest of today, Friday, Saturday or Sunday and we'll come in and power up on Monday and go for launch. RD-180 is a direct descendant of the huge closed cycle engine built in the 70s for the abortive Russian space shuttle program. It's been tailor-made for Lockheed Martin by the MPO Energomash Design Bureau, today one of the leading manufacturers of rocket engines in the world. Though Energomash has successfully powered over 2,000 rockets with 11,000 engines, this will be the Design Bureau's first ever launch from Cape Canaveral. And he always wants to make sure that he is taken care of when he arrives. 